Honduras of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba. This is from the south. I'm Laura Palmeiro. And this Monday in Bolivia, civilian groups in Santa Cruz, in the eastern part of the country, requested the armed forces to seize power, disregarding the overwhelming electoral victory of the movement towards socialism, acknowledged by all opposition parties and several world governments. With the slogans of the homeland is in danger, military help a group of Santa Cruz residents marched to the 8th Division Army headquarters to demand the armed forces to make their presence felt and attend their request. According to reports from local media, the demonstrators claimed they would stage a vigil near the military facility until they get a response from the Santa Cruz Regiment commander. No member of the de facto government has made any statement about this event so far. Leaders from the Indigenous Nationalities Confederation of Ecuador denied today an alleged police kidnapping during a social unrest against the government last October, for which they are under investigation. The leaders under investigation are the president of the Indigenous Nationalities Confederation of Ecuador and Leonidas Isa, who have led the people and nationalities of the Cotopaxi province. They both offered testimony to the Attorney General's office, where they claim to have taken part in the protests carried out nationwide with its epicenter in this capital against the neoliberal economic measures implemented by the Executive Office. Both Vargas and Isa are held responsible for kidnapping police officers at the House of Ecuadorian Culture last October 10th. No nos vamos a esconder. We are not going to hide. We will respond to the country. I believe, comrades, brothers and sisters, that the actions of last October 2019 were not those of a single leader. It was the Ecuadorian people as a whole. Outraged by so much corruption, comrades, the crisis implemented under the orders of the International Monetary Fund. To prosecute the leaders who are currently the visible head of the movement, the October unrest was not in response to the leader's summons. It was a response to the summons of the majority of the people and nationalities of Ecuador. Comrades, as a result, they are requesting our versions of what happened on Thursday, October 10th, in this case, at the House of Culture, as indeed, everyone knows that Comrade Innocencio Tucumbi was assassinated, and the only request at the time from thousands and thousands of families was a response to this crime committed on Wednesday 9th. Zeta hurricane has been downgraded to a tropical storm after making landfall in the Mexican peninsula of Yucatan. Rains and wind gusts are still hitting the area, and the National Hurricane Center of the United States has warned of the hurricane swells. Zeta hit the peninsula with winds up to 130 km per hour after downgrading its wind gusts to have slowed down to 70 km per hour. Its center is currently located at Espita Municipality, moving towards the northeast of the country to exit into the Mexican Gulf, where it is expected to regain its strength and become a hurricane again. America is approaching 20 million cases and exceeds 600,000 deaths from COVID-19, being the continent most affected by the pandemic. Despite leading the statistics in terms of COVID-19, the epicenter of the pandemic has returned to Europe, where new confinements are feared. America also leads the number of deaths with more than 626,000 Europe counts, 267,000. By country, the U.S. continues to lead with 8.9 million cases, while Brazil continues to be the third largest hit in the world. In addition, three other Latin American countries are the hardest hit by the pandemic. Those are Argentina, Colombia and Mexico. The remains of Bles José Gregorio Hernández were exhumed in Venezuela as part of the canonization process to declare him a saint. Madeleine García has the story. Un momento. One moment. Una historia. One story. José Gregorio Hernández. José Gregorio Hernández, the servant of God, was raised from his earthly rest. His remains were exhumed in a ceremony to be taken to Vatican City as part of the beatification process. 
I want on behalf of Venezuela and the peoples of the world here represented by their ambassadors to thank Pope Francis for the great gift of the beatification of our doctor of the poor. And I want to express to all the love and blessing from Pope Francis. At the Church of Our Lady of Candelaria, located in Caracas, Venezuela, music immortalized this day that brings him closer to beatification. This moment would have never been possible if Dr. José Gregorio Hernández had not granted a miracle to Yaxuri Solorzano, who is now with her mother. The girl took a shot in the head, which removed part of her brain, left her blind and almost completely disabled. Twenty days later, she was able to walk. It was a miracle by José Gregorio Hernández. And while they were singing Mass, the parishioners gathered outside the church to accompany him and also celebrate his 156th anniversary. They all have a story to tell. I prayed very faithfully to the Dr. Jose Gregorio Hernández to help my leg that I will be very good to him, and so it was, and after I never felt any more pain on my knee. Jesus arrived with his son to remember how his wife, now deceased, loved José Gregorio Hernández. Coming here brings him closer to his memories and connects him with his spirituality. With his presence, he honors both. I would be celebrating 38 years of marriage. My wife was Dr. Jorge Gregorio Hernández de Bodhi. And I am here to alleviate the diseases of the most humble people. May God be with them, and faith will always be with you. All of a sudden, a man came up almost like God's own blessed. It is Francisco, a popular artist who has represented him for years. It is part of the collective memory of the story that they will not let die. All these people were the ones that discovered him and carried on the process for Jose Gregorio's sainthood. Not only you have to be a saint, but also be recognized as such by the people. And he was recognized and the process has been growing like a snowball, that devotion to him. Some of the exhumed ashes will be taken in port to Vatican City and will also be distributed across 40 dioceses. Jose Gregorio Hernández's beatification is expected to be completed by the end of April 2021. And we'll be right back after this a very short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. As the United States head to the polls in the country's general elections, we welcome the journalist Abby Martin to offer her analysis of the process. Abby, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. So the, the early voting numbers indicate Americans are very motivated to cast their ballots this year. Is it possible it means this will likely be a high turnout election? So I think that all of the early voting numbers that we're seeing, which is, you're right, it's, it, it's a lot. It's astounding numbers across the board of people who are coming out early. We're less than two weeks away from the election. Millions of people have already cast their ballots. Um, I think that that's largely to be expected because of the pandemic. Um, and I think the fears of the doubt that Trump has cast on the early and mail voting system, we know all the measures that he's taken to um, make this really, really difficult for people to do. We know that the GOP has been maneuvering to actually, um, you know, sabotage uh, mail-in ballots uh, to a large extent. We know a lot of um, voter suppression methods that go along with this. So I think that people are scared, rightly so, and they want to come out early. They want to come out strong. 
and cast our ballots in the tens of millions. And that's exactly what we're seeing. But I do think that it's going to be hard to know what this signifies until Election Day because of the pandemic. You know, I mean, people don't want to show up and vote in person. <clears throat> also, Trump is egging on these militias to go basically patrol polling places on Election Day. So people <laughs> probably are scared with that, coupled with the fact that they don't want to catch this deadly virus. And I think that's why we're seeing numbers to the extent that we are. But it's also really important to know that historically in the United States, voter turnout is extremely low um, compared to other countries in general. Uh, we see large voter populations uh, um, that do not actually vote at all. Um, in the 2016 election, the largest voting bloc was actually non-voters. So 50% of eligible voters, which in the United States, we're talking about over 100 million people, simply did not engage in the political process. Um, and, you know, as much as people blame the Green Party and third party ballots um, on Trump's election, it's worth noting that in, a, that in a lot of these swing states, voters actually came out, cast their votes down ballot, but actually left president blank more so than did vote for Jill Stein and the Green Party. So it's really important to understand that's really the problem here is the lack of engagement from non-voters. And where are the Democrats? Um, what are they doing to really engage with this base? And what are they doing to bring these people out to the polls instead of this kind of locked in voter block that they expect to come out in every election? I think that really speaks to the fact that both parties do not meet the needs of the vast majority of working class people in this country when we're talking about 30 percent of people at least that can't afford, um, you know, that, that are living paycheck to paycheck, essentially. We have seen that, that Donald Trump campaigned in New Hampshire on Sunday, but the New Hampshire Union leader, a conservative newspaper in a state with a proud conservative tradition, backed Joe Biden for president. Which could be the impacts of this decision in the voters and your consideration? So I think it's important to understand that um, Joe Biden has been using kind of this strategy to court conservatives and Republicans, essentially, his entire campaign. <laughs> you can look at the field of the Democratic primary and kind of see that Joe Biden was almost the most right wing candidate up there. Uh, he kind of pioneered that that um, that rightward shift in the Democratic Party um, during the Clinton administration. And that's exactly what you're seeing today. He is, his rejection of um, things like the Green New Deal, his rejection and, and promising to veto Medicare for all when you know, the vast majority of people that both Democrats and Republicans agree with this. So I don't think it's going to change the outcome. Um, if you see what happened in 2016, this is kind of the same playbook that Democrats took on with the Clinton campaign. You saw people like Colin Powell, <laughs> you know, these Bush administration officials coming out and actually endorsing Hillary Clinton, just like you saw at the DNC, people like John Kasich coming out and endorsing Joe Biden, just like they endorsed Hillary Clinton. You actually had a strategist working for the Democratic Party saying, for every progressive that we might lose, we're going to pick up a Republican or a moderate along the way. And we saw that that strategy did not work um, Republicans pretty staunchly support Donald Trump. They know that hitching their wagging to him will push forward their radical agenda that we've seen. Look, he's already appointed three Supreme Court justices. They understand that Donald Trump is a vehicle for their agenda, um, and they're not going to go and attach themselves to Joe Biden. So even though we see kind of grifters from the Bush administration, like the Lincoln Project and dozens of these national security officials egging on people to vote for Joe Biden, I don't think it's going to work. And I think that, unfortunately, it kind of just reveals what Joe Biden's governing strategy is going to be. I don't think that he's just courting Republicans for the sake of getting Republican votes. I think that he's courting Republicans to promise them, hey, I'm going to govern the way that you want me to. We saw him promising that he will stack his administration with potentially Republican officials. We even saw him floating the idea of actually appointing a GOP official for his vice presidential <laughs> nomination. I mean, you really can't make this stuff up. And I think that the sacrifice that he's making to alienate progressive voters is really not going to play um, into a good strategy. And, you know, as I said before, I mean, this pandemic is really the only thing that's saving him and putting him within striking distance of winning the election.
election. I think without the deadly pandemic, Trump would have the election in the bag. So, um, do you know that President Donald Trump has just banned uh, from and says to Cuba. So, specialists consider this is a desperate decision to attract votes from the ultra-conservative sector in Florida. What do you think on this behalf? So, I, I think, you know, I, I do think in part this is a last-ditch effort for Trump to secure that voting block in Cuba, this really rabid um, anti-communist base that we see the right wing comprise of there. However, I don't think this is a last ditch effort in the, in the sense that he has been doing this, his entire administration so far. I mean, this is kind of in line with his character, with his policies. Uh, look no further than, than you know, pointing someone like Elliot Abrams, who was overseeing right wing death squads in Latin America to oversee Latin American policy. Look no further than appointing John Bolton to oversee and pursue these policies of the Monroe Doctrine. Um, and installing coups across Latin America, we see the devastating sanctions implemented against Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Cuba, um, revamping that normalization that Joe Biden put into place that was actually a really, really great measure. Um, of course, the embargo is still in place, this 50-year genocidal embargo that's preventing, um, that's preventing medicine and food from getting to the Cuban people. Uh, the troika of tyranny, right, to replace the axis of evil during the Bush administration. So all of these things, I feel like it's expected that Trump is going to cater to the right wing in Cuba. It's expected that he's, you know, basically running on anti-communism um, and honing in now, which I think is really scary, on blaming everything on the left. So he is literally running his campaign on saying the left is the problem, communists are the problem, socialists are the problem. And what's really sad is that you have Joe Biden kind of molding to that narrative that Trump has put out there. You have him campaigning now on saying, oh, no, I, I'm not a socialist. I'm not a socialist. Well, what are you talking about? We know that you're not a socialist. We know that Democrats aren't socialists. There's no one really in, in Congress that's a socialist. Uh, Bernie Sanders wasn't even a full socialist. So this fear mongering about communism and socialism is really um, is really just absolutely outrageous. And it's really taking center stage in this election. And sadly, you see Joe Biden falling prey and falling victim to that narrative and putting himself on the defense where you have Obama actually campaigning in Florida right now saying, I know Joe Biden, I know him well, and don't worry, he's not a socialist. It's like, well, what, what is your program to the millions of people who are suffering during the pandemic? What do you guys have for them instead of promising that you're not going to be socialist and communist? People are dying. People need help. People need economic assistance. So, you know, I think that when you're looking at this election, the polls nationally show Biden just completely trouncing Trump. But I think that that's really dangerous to, to say, oh, he has the election in the bag. Swing states, the polls are much closer, and this election is far closer than we think. Thank you, Abby. Thank you so much for joining us and for offering your insights on this important electoral process in the United States. And we're looking forward to welcome you to the show again. Thank you so much. Welcome back to From the South. International envoys mediating the crisis following last week's disputed election in Guinea used a government on Tuesday to leave a blockade on the home opposition leader Salao Dalain Diallo. Representatives from the United Nations, African Union and the 15-nation West African bloc ECOWAS said in a statement that Guinean authorities must lift a barricade in the spirit of inclusive dialogue. Police have barricaded Diallo inside his house for days as post-election clashes between his supporters and security forces raged last week, killing 20 people so far. The delegation regretted the acts of post-election violence that resulted in loss of life and destruction of public and private property. It expresses its condolences to the bereaved families and wishes a speedy recovery to the injured. 
The joint mission also called on the Guinean authorities to expedite investigations to shed light on the violence in order to bring the perpetrators to justice. It calls on the authorities to ensure that the defense and security forces act with restraint and professionalism in managing the demonstrations. And this Tuesday, the government spokesman Ali Rabie said Iran would welcome a U.S. return to the landmark nuclear deal under any president, but noted that Tehran would require guarantees from Washington to not withdraw again. It makes no difference to us which president in America decides to return to the GCPOA and stop creating obstacles for others in realizing their commitments. We would welcome such a decision by any president. But at the same time, while returning to the JCPOA, America should be ready to be held responsible for the damages that it has caused the people of Iran during the time it withdrew from the women. And of course, it must also be ready to provide other guarantees regarding not repeating such law breakings. On Tuesday, three people were killed in Afghanistan's capital, Kabul, in car bomb attack. According to Ferdawaz Faramars, spokesperson for the city's police chief, 10 other people were wounded in the attack. No one immediately claimed responsibility for the bombing, but both Taliban and Islamic State affiliates are active and have claimed previous attacks in the city. The violence comes as the UN mission in Afghanistan releases third quarter report showing a 30 percent decrease in civilian casualties. However, we evacuated around 10 to 15 wounded and dead bodies to hospitals from here. And we have come to the end of this news brief. It remembers you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. Join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Laura Palmeiro. Thank you for watching.